Good evening. The original aim of the Communists was to call for an independent Singapore. Alone. The first step towards this end was to demand the abolition of the Internal Security Council. The logical second step would be independence. Once Singapore is independent, the Communists believe they could undermine the Federation if necessary by force of arms. And the possibility of Malaya being divided in open warfare between North versus South is one which communist policy was heading for. The Tunku is ready to counter this. Had there been no drought in Johor and a water shortage in Singapore, for the last three months, the Communists might well have switched their line from internal self-government without the Internal Security Council to independence for Singapore alone. But unfortunately, nature reminded them of the utter absurdity of such a move. So they abandoned feelers which they sent out to test public reaction in articles which argued for immediate independence, published in the Nanyang Political Science magazine and the University of Malaya Socialist Club magazine, the Fajar. They have now opposed our practical proposals for merger by going to the other extreme of calling for complete merger as a twelfth state like Penang where education and labour will be controlled by the Central Federation Government. On this, they cannot go back so easily. I must explain why complete merger as a twelfth state like Penang means that Singapore citizens cannot automatically get Federation citizenship. Complete merger would mean that only people born in Singapore automatically become Federation citizens, just as only those who were born in Penang automatically became Federation citizens. In the radio forum on the 21st of September, when Dr. Lee Siu Cho asked Dr. Go Keng Sui to explain the Federation Constitution to him, Dr. Lee learned for the first time that out of the present 650,000 adult Singapore citizens, only half, about 325,000, were born here and would automatically get Federation citizenship on complete merger like Penang. Yet he demanded this. He did not know that those who were not born in Penang had to apply for registration as citizens. One condition is residence in the Federation for 8 out of 12 years. But another more difficult condition is that a person must have knowledge of the Malay language, the national language. If the Barisan Socialists had their way, large numbers of persons out of the 325,000 Singapore citizens who have come from other parts of the world like China and India and even from the Federation of Malaya will not get Federation citizenship because they have no knowledge of Malay. It means that a few hundred thousand people who now have Singapore citizenship will suddenly lose their rights. Only a young, inexperienced and reckless group of people would ever dream of doing this. We want all Singapore citizens to retain all rights and privileges which they enjoy at present, regardless of whether they were born here or elsewhere in China or India. Even those who cannot obtain Federation citizenship by registration should keep their present Singapore citizenship rights. In addition, they will become Federal Nationals. In international law, there will be no difference between Federal Nationals who are Singapore citizens and federal nationals who are Federation citizens. Both will have the same passport of the larger Federation government. 
Even in internal laws, there will be little difference, except that Singapore citizens will vote for their representatives in Singapore and Federation citizens will vote for their representatives in the Federation, both to the same federal parliament. All federal nationals, whether Singapore or Federation citizens, will be equal before the law and the courts of the larger federation. The difference between a Singapore citizen and a Federation citizen, who will both be federal nationals, will be similar to the present difference between a Johor citizen and a Malacca citizen, who are both Federation citizens. They have equal national rights under the central government. But on state rights, each exercises his privileges in his own state. We have proposed that the citizens of the new and larger federation should be called federal nationals, so as not to confuse people by using a phrase such as new federation citizens. As soon as all legal details on citizenship, or federal nationality as it will be called, have been worked out, they will be published. There are also various sectional interests to be protected on merger. The English educated want to be assured that merger does not mean that the 4 to 1 ratio between Malays and non-Malays will apply in the Singapore section of the civil service. Businessmen, contractors and bus companies want to be assured that priority for tenders and licenses will be as before, with no priorities or special rights for anybody. Chinese parents who want their children to go to Chinese schools want to be assured that the present policy of equal treatment of all streams of education will go on. Workers want to be assured that our pro-labor policy will continue. Merchants want to be assured that our free port status and our free trade with all countries will continue, and that our trading links with the whole world will remain as they have been, free and easy. The Federation Government understands the special conditions of our economy and social conditions, so fair and suitable arrangements can be worked out. Every legitimate interest will be protected, but in the end, the Communists will still find merger unpleasant because security comes under central government control. However fair and just the arrangements on citizenship or federal nationality and on every other matter, the Communists will still oppose. Their real objection is that security will be in the hands of a strong central federal government. Unfortunately, they cannot admit this selfish interest publicly, so they will have to find fault with every conceivable other point to achieve their aim to block merger. But should we stop merger just in order to allow them to use a semi-colonial Singapore as a base to undermine the Federation? Should we risk a conflict that would ruin our country and our lives, many problems will be solved by merger. But never forget that as we, the people in the two territories, get together, and as the nationalist and socialist organizations in the two territories unite, so also will the communist front organizations. In Singapore, Barisan Socialists is the main open front communist organization. As a subsidiary, they have Party Rakyat. They also have a few cadres planted in the Workers' Party and they are trying to penetrate Ong Eng Guan's United People's Party. Their open front cadres are talking of getting these four parties into a Singapore Socialist Front, which they can control, just as they control the Federation Socialist Front. In the Federation, the Communists have very heavily 
penetrated the Labour Party of Malaya. The penetration of the Party Rakyat of the Federation is less than that in the Labour Party. But the pro-communist cadres dominate the combination of the Labour Party and Party Rakyat in the Federation Socialist Front. Lim Kian Siu, the secretary of the Socialist Front, is a younger brother of Lim Kian Chai, the man who disappeared in 1951 when wanted by the police. Lim Kian Siu was in Singapore from the 14th to the 16th of July to agree with PAP on a proposed conference on Malaysia of socialist parties from the Federation, Singapore and Borneo. On the night of the 14th, he went to see his brother Lim Kian Chai. But Rahim Ishak, who went to his hotel to have a chat with him, was told by Lim Kian Siu's organizing secretary, Lolan, that he had gone to the pictures. The next day, 15th of July, at about noon, Lim Kian Siu and Dr. Wee Li Fong of Kloang had a discussion in my conference room with Rajaratnam and myself. Lim Kian Siu's line was exactly the same as that of Lim Chin Siang's, namely, that Singapore and the Borneo territories should get independence separately first. Then, later, we can all discuss merger with the Federation. He may or may not know that this plan suits the Communists very well. As I have explained earlier, as long as Singapore is a colony, the Communist struggle can be disguised as an anti-colonial struggle. So the Communist struggle in Sarawak can also be similarly disguised in the Sarawak United People's Party as an anti-colonial united front of nationalists and communists in a struggle for independence. My colleagues and I have friends amongst our counterparts, the non-communist socialists in the Labour Party and the Party Rakyat. The communists are extremely agitated that we, the non-communist socialists, in the Federation and in Singapore, should get together and strengthen each other's hand. On the 21st of September, 61, about two weeks ago, Lim Kian Siu, Secretary General of the Socialist Front, issued a circular to all Socialist Front branches, telling them that they should not make any contact or discuss anything with PAP members from Singapore. And they asked that any contact with PAP must be reported back to him. I quote these words from his circular. I am informed that Devon Nair came up to the Federation with Raja Ratnam. It showed one thing, that even as far back as August, there were already talks of PAP forming branches in Malaya. Already his, he meant my lieutenants, in Selangor, as far back as 1960, had been talking about the Malayan PAP. He went on to say, I would be very happy if the executive could pass a decision that all contacts made by the PAP with any one of us should be disclosed to us fully so that we will know. And he ends up by saying, I hope you are treating this as secret and I hope that I could be allowed to issue a statement warning the PAP. The real fact is that they do not want our non-communist socialist counterparts in the Federation to get together with us and compare notes on the true position in the Federation and in Singapore. Lim Kian Siu is just a front leader in the Federation as Dr. Lee Siu Cho is their front leader 
in Singapore. In Sarawak, the Communists have already penetrated the SUPP, Sarawak United People's Party, and can influence sections of it. As Malaysia takes shape together with merger, the Communists in Malaya and in Borneo are also planning to get their open front organizations in these territories together. Members of the secret Communist organization of Sarawak have maintained contact with Lim Chin Siong through Dr. Lee Siu Cho. Dr. Lee was the P.O. box for Lim Chin Siong. A letter from a communist undercover organizer in Sarawak was sent to Lim Chin Siong as recently as the second half of September, about two weeks ago, via Dr. Lee, the man who told Dr. Go and me that he saw no harm in working with the communists. So obviously he sees no harm in being a post box for them. And yet Dr. Lee, in an interview reported in The Guardian on the 22nd of September, stated, I am not a communist, and if I became convinced that there were communists in our party, I would expose them and let the people decide. But instead of exposing them, he aided and abetted them by acting as a courier. The communists know that they cannot stop merger or Malaysia, however hard they try. They are preparing now to bring their open front organization in the three territories into closer association for ultimate coordination and unification as merger and Malaysia takes place. So Lim Kien Siu came down to attend the Barisan Socialist inaugural meeting on the 17th of September, representing the Federation side of the Communist Front. And two Communists from the Sarawak Communist Front were to have been sent to attend the same meeting. They complained when they were not allowed to. With merger, communist strength, which is scattered in little concentrated pockets like Singapore and in places like Penang, will be diluted in a bigger nationalist whole. With Malaysia, communist strength will be diluted even more. But although the problem is lessened, it is not over. It goes on. Communist cadres will go on organizing and trying to capture the leadership of the trade unions, political parties, cultural associations, old boys associations, and student clubs. As they lose old cadres, they will recruit new ones. But their futile struggle, based on wrong assumptions, wrong analysis, and wrong strategy, will continue to meet with failure. However, we cannot afford to be complacent. The long-term solution is to present the people with a clean and effective alternative to the communist, rigidly disciplined society. To prevent new recruitment, we must offer healthy and dynamic leadership to channelize the idealism of our young men and women of the coming generation as they leave our schools and universities. I have recounted these events to you so that you can better judge what is in your best interests. Some of the facts that I have disclosed are not in favor of my colleagues or myself, but you have to know them. You judge the truth for yourselves from what I have said and also from what the persons involved have not been able to deny. You'll notice that yesterday, the 8th of October, these persons about whom I have spoken in disclosing the communist conspiracy, they have only said that all this is a smear. What we want to ask them is, which particular part of any one of my talks is untrue, and therefore just a smear. 
We are about to enter a new phase in our struggle for a happier and more prosperous Malaya. We will do our best for you as a government. But in the end, remember, your future is in your own hands. This is the last of my first series of broadcasts. In 12 short talks, I have ranged over the events of the last 16 years since the war. I have tried to put before you in bold relief the principal features of our political problems. Political problems ultimately mean the problems of how we make our living, how we can give everyone a fair and equal chance to study, to work and to have a full life. There are so many more things that you must know about what's going on in Singapore. My colleagues, To Chin Chai, Go Keng Sui, and several others who have played their part in the memorable years since 1945 will, from their own experiences, fill in the blanks that I have not been able to cover myself. Then I shall round off these discussions in another series in which I hope to explain why merger which is vital to our survival, is not by itself alone a complete answer for all our social and economic problems. Merger will give us a large enough national and economic base to build our better society. But build it we must ourselves, for these things do not come about by themselves.